Well, I mean, I, I know you've been talking for, for years about, you know, removing the economic and, uh, you know, the, the, the barriers, basically, to art by, by building audiences. We're now facing, you know, worst economic downturn, arguably, in seven decades. I think by your own estimation that uh, cultural attractions are down 12 to 20 percent. Uh, you've told your staff they have to do things differently. What is that? What does that look like, doing things differently in this environment? I'm going to sound like a manager, like, nerd. I don't want to, in front of my friends, I don't want to sound like a manager nerd, okay? But it has to do with the way you create decision making capability in an institution so that people actually can see their visions realized. The AGO has layered itself rightly during the building process to make sure there are lots of checks and balances, which is why I never tire of saying we were on time and on budget and raised all our money in time for the opening because we were very deliberate about how we moved through. We have to relax a bit. We have to make take bigger risks in some of our decision-making capabilities, and we have to empower people to do their thing. And that is getting rid of some of the layers within our institution. Yeah, but that's the management stuff. I mean, yeah. your background is you're a curator, not a manager. Yeah, but uh, I'm trying to impress my mother. <laughs> <laughs> but you, you've said, you know, the building's there now. I mean, you've even told the trustees they can, you know, take a breath and not have to worry about raising money for the next little while. The challenge is building audiences. Yeah. Tell me what kind of programming you need in both this economic environment and in the, the world that we live in right now with so many other distractions and, and, and attractions. How do you have to change that, that experience and physically, I guess, what, what's in an art museum these days? Uh, so this is a slippery slope because the first thing I have to say is people will come back for the um, power of the art experience. Right? The quality of the art, the meaning of the art, the sense that it's extraordinary, the Master of the Innocence, this extraordinary collection of t the room of Lauren Harris and Tom Thompson. I mean, these are moments that you just don't forget. But, okay, and the but comes back to something that John Tapscott talks a little bit about, which is the idea of the prosumer, the person who is both a consumer and a producer. Right. And how that sets up a new challenge in the museum space to make meaning differently, which is why, for example, we have whatever it is, 12 or 14 drawing stations throughout the gallery, where you can actually sit, and by the way, they're usually busy, where people can actually sit in a space and augment their experience of looking by doing and expressing and sharing. And there are other moments in the gallery throughout, different kinds of interpretation and engagement where people can be encouraged to make some meaning and not just be passive. And you know, listen, we're trying to figure out all the different ways to do it. We are not perfect. But if you're looking for a push at the AGO, it is to engage the visitor as an active participant. So for example, we allow cell phone use at the AGO. Okay? And by the way, it's gone very well, right? We have a little square where if you're talking to your if you're having a fight with your girlfriend, you have to stand over there. Or if you're talking about grocery shopping, you have to stand over there. But other than that, it's highly respectful. And why did we make this decision? Because, uh, because we could always change it, right? In other words, if it turned out it was the wrong bet and the people using their cell phones were actually distracting the experience of, uh, uh, of looking, we, we, we could change it or try and modify behavior. But the reality is you wanted to get a new generation into the art gallery. And you can't really just say no cell phones because they'll say, well, it's not a place for me. And by the way, uh, something like 28% of the visitors to the AGO are now under the age of 30. One of the oldest debates within the cultural industries. That is, that's very good. I just made that up. No, OK, that, <laughs> not true. Uh, there are enough board members here. I'm telling the truth. Don't worry. No. One of the oldest fights relates to that very, very question. I mean, you know, are museums areas of, of higher education, edification, designed for those who have a true aesthetic, or are they public spaces that are supposed to be accessible to all and, you know, the unwashed and the ignorant among them? Where are you on that continuum? Okay, so we have some galleries where there are no labels. Yes. Okay. Then we have galleries where you have so many labels that you can barely actually see the work of art. We're big enough to do both. 
And so my answer to you is we're, we're big enough to serve both purposes. So um, we're big enough to be a place of gathering and of communion and sharing ideas and people talking loudly. And there are plenty of spaces for people to have quiet, contemplative moments. The question is how to make sure people understand they have that accessibility. So there are two spaces in the gallery that are quite, for me, symbolic. One is a gallery on the second floor in a corner called the Paradise Room, where there are no labels, and there's just Webern music playing and uh, four objects, and that's it. And the other is Walker Court. And I said to some colleagues the other day, you know, as good as Walker Court is, is as good as the AJO will be. I want, I want to talk about that more. But because, it's, because it's a public space, a place of gathering, and how do, you, how do we figure out how to put art in that space? Many of us were very surprised when the Ontario government announced the, that the AGO and among, among other institutions was going to get uh, almost $9 million one time uh, grant and $10 million increase uh, to operating budget. I mean, needless to say, that didn't just fall out of the sky. By happenstance, there was some pretty vigorous lobbying going on. Marshal that case for me. Tell me what you were telling the government of Ontario and, and people who are in government, especially when they are so cash-strapped about why spending on culture makes sense in today's environment. Well, there were two arguments. One was why, how you make that argument, and then why does the AGO get so much, right? And uh, on the second point, um, the argument was in part what you saw with David and I tonight which is that leaders like David understand that they're strengthened by the strength of other institutions. It's not an either or. So as the AGO rises, so too the prospects of all cultural institutions. And I think that spirit was something the government could understand, and we made that case, you know. Um, uh, but the case for culture. The case for culture is, first of all, this government is pretty terrific in understanding the creative economy. The Ontario government. The Ontario government. Um, <laughs> Uh, well, and I also have to say the mayor. I mean, the mayor also, in, in, in the face of challenges, raised cultural spending this year as well and kept to his word that it would go up when it could have been easy for him not to do so. And I think that we may be surprised by what Ottawa does in the next little while, not necessarily for us, but as a reinvestment. But that said, this government did understand, does understand, first of all, you can't let your flagships fail, right? You can't let them not do the work that you've already encouraged them to do, which is to become tourist destinations, and equally important, and I have to say we push this, the notion of the creative mind, the development of imagination. If you look at this government's priorities around healthy citizens and educational initiatives that's laid out in their plan, which we've read, you can slide into it a whole range of attributes of culture that fit seamlessly with that vision. A healthy community is formed by people coming to an art gallery, thinking about different cultures, thinking about what, the way in which creativity works, understanding that you can be a creative person yourself. These are all things that we argued and which, frankly, um, I have to say that many ministers um, responded. You know, I wrote. George Smitherman, Smitherman an email to say thank you very much. You know, we had talked and I had said this, that, and the other. He came, he liked it, all the rest. I wrote him an email after the decision and he emailed the back, and I have to say quickly, we are as happy as you are. I mean, I thought that was fabulous. Like, what more could you want? So in other words, that we could in fact uh, make this argument about creativity, actually they listened. A couple minutes on... Uh, I can see he's not going to give me 10 million bucks. <laughs> he's, he's skeptical. He's looking, he's thinking, okay, it's all right. A couple minutes on, uh, on you before we reopen the, uh, the bar. I mean, an old friend once said there's no such thing as a lifetime of experience. There's just five years that repeats itself every five years. Uh, looking at your biography, I mean, you have been fascinated with art and visual art your entire life. Why that continuing fascination? What excites you? as a human being about what's going on in the visual art world today? What gets me going uh, around the, in the art world is what I don't know. 
And um, I actually think what I don't know is more interesting than what I do know, frankly. And the reason I'm as interested in artists as I am is because I think they actually can help me. And I often think about... How, how so? Expand on that. Well, because, you know, they're using language and developing ideas uh, that are there. And we're all working to catch up. And, of course, in that gap between their work and our understanding is the hostility that often exists for contemporary artists. And I think it's a brave thing to do, to go out there and keep pushing. But the point is that what's being pushed is a new way of thinking about something, right? A non-language-based, experiential, form-based practice that um, uh, creates new ideas or a new per potentially unlocks in the viewer a new way of solving a problem. And um, I never, and I grew up, my, my dad was a painter, I never um, worry about going into a situation where I don't, and this isn't actually true, what I'm about to say. <laughs> what I was about to said, say was... The truth is, I lied. Yeah, the, you know, I, ha I was going to say that I've never, I don't go into a situation where I'm not worried about, about what I don't know. But when I go into Gilles Ouellette's office, I'm nervous if I don't know the stuff that he knows. So that's maybe a bit different. But about artists, I'm not nervous about knowing well, because they're going to help me unlock what they're trying to do.